Hey, it's the Behind the Books podcast, and we're still just getting started, aren't we? We are. We're three episodes in now, and we couldn't be more pleased to have everyone listen to Lynn Kohick, one of the associate editors of Dictionary Paul and His Letters, second edition, interview contributor Janine Brown. Yeah, and one of the things I'm really loving about this so far is that our concept for the Behind the Books podcast is really working. Can we pat ourselves on the back? Because we are book nerds, Mm -hmm. right? You're a book nerd. I'm a book nerd. And we love talking about books. And we also love getting to know the people behind them, the processes that go into them. How do these books get conceived? How do they get written? How do they get edited? How do they get published? That's the kind of thing we really want to talk about on this podcast all the time. And the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters is the perfect project to get started because so many people have been involved. And two of them are on this episode and they're two really interesting people. That's right. And one of the things about our type of publishing, Christian academic publishing, is that there's a lot of kind of mystery for some people about how to get in, about how to publish, how to have the right credentials to do X, Y, or Z. And so some of the heartbeat behind what we're doing is to let you inside, to pull back the curtains to let you get to know the men and women who had paths that you might be currently on right now. Right. We want to demystify it. That's right. There's too much mystery. So here we go. What did we love about this episode? I think it's really interesting to hear in some length from Professor Janine Brown. She's the author of two really important articles in the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, one on hermeneutics and interpreting Paul, and the other one on Philippians, such a keystone book in the whole New Testament, Letter of Paul, and she's really got unique insight. And then her interviewer is Lynn Kohek, a major figure in the field herself, and getting to be a fly on the wall and listen to these two talk with each other is really a privilege. Mm -hmm. They're talking about citizenship and the uh, dynamics of what Christian identity within the Roman Empire and within the kingdom of God. One of the questions that Lynn asks Janine, particularly around the area of themes and threads that exist between the Gospels and Paul. And that's significant because Janine was the associate editor on the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, second edition. And so she has an expertise both in the Gospels and also in Paul. It's a nice conversation to see what commonality as well as what differences exist between Pauline literature and Gospel literature. Yeah, another interesting topic they get into is what it's like for female biblical scholars in the academy these days and in the guild of New Testament scholars in particular. Janine and Lynn both have been walking that path and their experience is pretty interesting. I bet a lot of listeners are going to be fascinated to hear more. We hope you enjoy this episode. Well, hello, my name is Lynn Kohick, and I am so excited to be joined today on this podcast with Janine Brown, my good friend, who also goes by, Janine, I have to give your title here, the David Price Professor of Biblical and Theological Foundations at Bethel Seminary. Wow. But you wear it well because, you know, you deserve that title. That's really awesome. Welcome, Janine. Thank you. I don't I don't use it a lot. It doesn't roll <laughs> off the tongue. I'll just say I teach New Testament. Well, there you go. Yes. And we have been New Testament buddies for a long time. And I love the work that you do. I use your books, including Scripture as Communication, which is in its second edition. I've used that. Uh, I just had so much fun with students. They love it in my hermeneutics class. So thank you for all the work that you do in the New Testament field. Thank you so much. It's great to hang out with you again. Fun to do. Yeah, thanks. Well, and what's also kind of fun, I think, is that although we're talking about the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, the second edition, you also have been the associate editor of the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, the second edition. So you love these dictionaries. It's awesome. I do. I do. I loved them before I was ever a part of the editing process, but came to love them even more, kind of seeing the inner workings. And it just proved to me how valuable they can be. Yeah. Well, and we'll dive into the project itself in a minute. But, you know, you and I had a chance over the years to share stories and all of that. But I'd love to just hear a little bit about your academic 
journey. How did you get started in New Testament studies? Well, um, I came to seminary and I actually came to Bethel Seminary where I now teach many years ago out of campus ministry where I'd had all sorts of wonderful, more informal training, but I, I was feeling more and more the need for formal training had never taken a Bible course in my life, was a music major in college. And so I went to Bethel Seminary and just fell in love with Greek and with New Testament studies, took every class I could. I'm thrifty, so I did not necessarily take it for credit. I would take a lot of audits. Everything Bob Stein was teaching, Tom Schreiner was teaching, those were two of the faculty in New Testament. Uh, I would take those courses or audit them and loved every minute of it and had the opportunity to become a TA for Robert Stein, Bob Stein. And he really mentored me and encouraged me to think about doctoral work, um, loved teaching, never thought I'd write. Like he was so prolific at the time when I was his TA and I got help with some of his projects. He was writing The Entry on Divorce and the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, first edition. And I reviewed a, a book or two for him, so for his work, so he could have, you know, kind of the quick view of various books on the topic. So I remember being even part of it back then, which was exciting. I thought, well, I'm not going to do writing like he does. And he was so wise. And he said, well, Janine, think about doing a PhD so you can teach. Because I knew I loved teaching. It had some experience stepping into his classrooms. And then, yeah, you'll probably find something to write about someday. <laughs> he was, of course, right. He was correct. Yes, yes. And that's just along those same lines. If if you were Bob to another younger scholar starting out now, what advice might you give? Yeah, and I do think it's, I think I've learned from him and others, the importance of letting people kind of take their own path or, or recognizing that there's not one path to this thing of academia of biblical studies, of New Testament studies, whatever way you've come into it, I'd say pay attention to that and follow God's lead. And don't think you have to mimic other people. I think that's one of my biggest pieces of advice. The path can be really organic and that those things that shape you will then shape your work in the future. And I would say if I said something a little more prescriptive, you know, land where you love, you know, in terms of where in the New Testament or, or biblical studies or whatever you're doing. And I'd also encourage people to pay attention to the hermeneutical questions surrounding what they're drawn to. You know, why am I drawn there? What kinds of methods will I bring? How will I, you know, what voices will I listen to? How will I do this thing? Not just the what will I do, but how will I do it? I feel like that's been really important for me. And it's expanded my thinking and my reach and my work to think about the kind of the, not just methodological, but part of it, but sort of the hermeneutical backdrop has been really important. So I just encourage people to always think about, so why? Why did I choose that? Why did that person think that way? How did they get there? Those are cool questions to ask. Be curious about that. Yes. Yeah. So true. I can look back also on the really twists and turns. How did I get here? Wow. It was not a straight line. And there were serendipitous right. moments. Um, sometimes, though, there are also, along with the high moments, there's also some low points. Is there any, I don't know if I want to call it setback, I'll say low point mm. that you reflect on now and kind of what it taught you maybe? Yeah, I would. I was. I was trying to think of something. I tend to be a half glass full person, so I'm like, and I didn't plan. I mean, like, I didn't grow up thinking this is my career, so I didn't have these grand aspirations. So I wasn't like, oh, that didn't go the way it planned. Most of the time, I wasn't planning that far ahead. But I would say, speaking of my mentor Bob Stein, and then my PhD work Arlen Hulpkren, and along the way, many other people, most of them were men. In biblical studies, they were all men until my doctoral work. And I think you might say a low or kind of a sense of how do I find my way here was figuring out what it meant to have mentors, colleagues who are women who really could understand on some level, maybe more intuitively, quickly, kind of what I was experiencing. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to kind of set up you know, like I'm so different from all the men who've mentored me. I'm so similar to all the men who've mentored me because I've been shaped by them. Well, I remember somebody asking me early on in my career, maybe a couple of years into teaching, what difference does it make that you're a woman biblical scholar? I'm like, I don't know. I'll tell you when I find out because I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, I haven't done it as a man yet, so I can't, you know, exactly. make the contrast. Yeah. Right. And I've been shaped so much by men and I've appreciated the learning. So I think coming to find some female mentors, and then female colleagues like you and others who oh, just give me a space to breathe and process things and not have to, 
okay, how did, how did, how did that, was that going to be received? I don't have to filter so much. And I found many male colleagues with whom that's also true. Yes. So, but it took a while to find those kind of voices and conversations and people who could just let you be yourself as this emerging scholar. Yes. Yeah. And I think it, I'll echo what you're saying. It's kind of designed as a men's field. And so, I don't know, just even on little things, let's go out for a drink. You know, I'm not going to sit down with beer and barbecue wings, maybe, but a glass of wine and some cheese and crackers, you know, I don't, it's just certain things that, you know, I don't always wear a lapel. So where do I put the lapel mic, you know, stick it in your pocket while I have a dress. It's just, there's some little things that remind you this field was shaped by men. And okay, that's just kind of how it is, you know, but like you say, then it's fun when there are others who are, you know, facing this sort of the same kinds of things. And you and I have also talked a lot in raising our kids. And I talk with male colleagues about that as well. But it's a little different when moms are talking about what they're facing. When primary parents get together and chat about what that looks like. Yes, yes. As we're as we're also doing this other kind of work much of the time. That's right. That's right. And let's dive into that because we do spend a lot of time, you and I, I would say, geeking out or nerding out on <laughs> <We do. laughs> the stuff that we love and wish ever The really good stuff. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So we've talked a little bit about your memories of even the first versions of the Dictionary of Paul and his letters and also Jesus and the Gospels. Is there anything else you want to add to that or maybe reflect on how important they've been for your life? I mean, I've used them in my own work and I have definitely, re I've required them as texts in early on in the classes because they're kind of the perfect setup. They're the right length article, not too short like a Bible dictionary, you know, somewhere between a thousand and 10,000 words. I know that seems like long on the one end, but, you know, kind of right in the sweet spot for talking about what should be focused on in studying something initially. And then the bibliographies, especially because you now we have a brand new set of bibliographies in the 2023 Dictionary of Palmas Letters, are so fresh and ready for use. So it's just a great entree into these various topics in Paul, whether particular books or themes or Old Testament use in Paul, all that kind of stuff, are just a great place to go. So I've used them myself, and I've certainly encouraged students to use them as well. I think they're kind of the perfect tool in one sense. Yes, yes. Well, in the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters, the second edition, you have two entries. We'll take a look at those. You did hermeneutics, or interpreting Paul, and also Philippians. What made you say yes to those essays? Uh, yeah, it wasn't hard to say yes to either. I felt like I was asked to do not kind of the, the ones that I'm like, what? But the ones that really fit. I was starting, I had said yes to a Philippians commentary in the Tyndale series. And I was just on the cusp of writing that. So writing the Philippians entry was sort of this perfect short version of even my introduction. And I certainly expanded on it and shifted some things. But generally speaking, it was just a perfect setup for me. So I was grateful for that opportunity. And then the hermeneutics, I, I, mean, I love those questions. And so uh, the first edition, Grant Osborne did the entry in the first edition. And I said, number one, things had changed so much hermeneutically. The hermeneutical landscape was so different in 2021 or whenever I signed the contract for it. And he had written about, you know, uh, sort of philosophical hermeneutics and then some particular issues in Paul. And I just thought, okay, what are the big question marks as you come to Paul in terms of the how? How do I enter here? What kinds of things do I cover? And that was really fun to even just sketch out the outline. I was like, oh, this is all very, it's like a bunch. And then I realized afterwards, oh my goodness, this is a bunch of little research topics. This is going to take some work. So I, I roped in one of our grads, Nick Fox, who also did his PhD in Luke Acts, but was very conversant in Paul and hermeneutics particularly. And we kind of split up some of the things that we needed to do some legwork on. So um, I just, yeah, I loved going through and thinking, okay, interpretively, what difference does it make when you, if you think that there are seven Pauline letters, 10 or 13, you know, in terms of authentic Paul, how does that make a difference? How does it make a difference to think about ancient rhetoric in Paul? Or how, what are some of the approaches within current, you know, gendered or feminist readings of Paul? What does that bring to the table? So I got to think about a lot of different topics and then try to make it very accessible all the way through. Because then readers are going to read these just little forays into little topics. We want to make sure that it was clear and at the right kind of accessible entry level and get them interested in 
these different topics. So I thought that was just a hoot. (laughs) As you're looking at that, do you feel maybe you exposed a common misconception people might have about Paul and hermeneutics as you went through? Well, I think more and more people are recognizing the pastoral practical theology that is Paul in his letters. In other words, the occasional nature, but not something to just toss aside and say unimportant, but how Paul applies pastoral wisdom in really different and sometimes very troubling, difficult contexts. And to hear the theology on the ground or what Duncan talks about, you know, the theologizing of Paul in the letters, to turn it from treatise to no, really kind of working it out in the trenches, I think is a really inter- important interpretive move. People have already been going there, but I don't think it hurts us to remind ourselves of that. And I certainly wanted to remind people using the dictionary, maybe when I think about my students or other people who are just entering Paul, to make sure that they're thinking of the genre, kind of what are these letters? How do they communicate theology? They certainly do, but how do they do that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I I know you've worked an awful lot in Matthew, and so I thought I'd throw this question out as well. Because you've done so much work also in the Gospels, what were some common threads you saw as you dove into interpretation of Paul? That was a great question. I had to ponder that for a little bit. Well, I mean, the commonalities I think that are really important is, the one is how much both the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, use the Old Testament. I know different amounts in Pauline letters uh, in terms of citation, allusion, etc., and different ways in the Gospels, but they're also steeped in the Jewish story, in the Jewish scriptures, and various kind of important insights in recent work in intertextuality, like Metalepsis, where you think, oh, and this is just one little slice of a text, but in a larger context, the larger part of the story being evoked from the Old Testament citation that sits around it, that, that it, does this fit a key part of the story of of Israel and so of Jesus or of of the church, that kind of thing. And tonight, tonight I'm teaching a course and I'm we're in Romans. So we're going to go through Romans nine through eleven, that really easy part of Romans. And if you look at your footnotes, NIV has citations and allusions noted in footnotes. You can walk through the canon in Romans nine through eleven: Genesis, Exodus, the prophets, i.e., exile. So they walk through this, the key moments of the storyline. Uh, Paul does related to the question of Israel. And I think it's really important that he's talking in a storied kind of way, or he's drawing from the story to talk about what seems to be just individuals, but it's not just individuals, it's people representing their nations that are being addressed all the way through, I think. So Old Testament, so important in both sets of the parts of the New Testament. And I also think sometimes the Torah has been viewed very differently between Matthew and Paul. Paul tosses it off or whatever, you know, the kind of traditional views. And so being in Matthew and, you know, I've not come to abolish the Torah and the prophets, but to fulfill them. I tend to bring that lens into Paul. And I figure it's been so long that Paul has been brought into Matthew and kind of made it uh, skewed things a bit. So why not just bring Matthew into Paul and see what happens? So that's my lens to say the way that they both address Judaism is emerged from an internal, we are Jews, we are thinking about faithfulness in covenantal perspective. How does that look now in the time of the Messiah? So I tend to see a kind of a within Judaism kind of way of reading maybe both Paul and Matthew to a certain extent. Differences? It's different, I think, to take on Paul because whether you think 7, 10, or 13, you have a corpus, which of course you do in Luke Acts, although people debate that. And you do have John in some ways, John in the letters. Of course, people debate that in terms of authorship, right? It's just Paul, we have for sure more than one thing by Paul. But I work in Matthew and nothing else is written by Matthew except for that first gospel or written by, you know, the person who wrote Matthew. And So uh, there's something about staying in a book and just not having to ask those questions of relationship. And so in Paul, especially in our my hermeneutics entry, we had I talked about the relationship of the letters one to the other and how we think about interpreting when we have a different implied author in Galatians than in Philippians, even though they're both nobody disputes they're both written by Paul. So I use that implied author concept a little bit to kind of say how is it that we think about multiple pieces by one author and still try to really center our thinking within the letter that we're working with. Yeah, that's so good. Let's jump to those letters, the letter of the Philippians that that you did. You uh, 
mentioned just now that implied author. You talk about in in your essay that Timothy co-sponsored uh, the letter, but that Paul uses that first person singular. So a lot of it is his work. So you're not disputing the Pauline authorship, but you like that idea of implied author. Can you help us understand that a little bit more, not so much in relation to Matthew, but just even in relation to Paul's letters itself? Yeah. When we know that he wrote the letter, there kind of no dispute. I think the implied author concept, which comes out of literary studies, and it comes out of um, in narrative approaches that understand that we can identify the author as we get to know them from the text itself. So the author sort of inscribed in the text. I think it's a helpful sort of a heuristic, a starting point for interpreting any work, and certainly Philippians, because if you think about, at least for me as a Protestant, the books that are quintessential Paul. Yeah, Romans. I mean, what would you say those are? Galatians, yep. And Galatians, right? You know, so anything that has to do with justification, justification by faith. Well, then, so I'm in Philippians, and it's so easy to bring that implied author of those letters. Or So Marcus Bachmuel has this lovely little phrase. He talks about the mental icon we have of Paul in any particular letter, you know, so that we do have this image of Paul. And so being aware of that, the implied author kind of ties me to Philippians, the, the mental icon of Paul we get from Philippians and, and holds me there longer. So I don't just say, oh, but in Galatians, hmm. I go to the other letters, of course, to think about how, you know, language that Paul typically uses and all that kind of stuff. But to start with the Paul we know from Philippians, there's debate in Philippians studies whether, I mean, it feels like a really warm letter, letter of friendship it has warmth to it. The relationship seems good, but there have been plenty of scholars who have suggested there's tension underneath and there's maybe a big, they're embroiled in this or that. And I often just wonder, I don't see as much evidence in the text itself. And I wonder if we're taking sort of a mental icon or an implied author from somewhere else, you know, Galatians, Paul's cranky letter, as I like to call it. And it, we're you know saying Paul's kind of this contests, you know, he just, he's not afraid to say that, you know, and are we tr- bring that into a letter where that just doesn't, Lay as well because of the relational dynamics. First Corinthians, yeah. I mean, he's pressing his authority. He doesn't have to do that here. He doesn't use I'm your apostle language at all in Philippians. He is, you know, a brother. He's a sibling with them. So I think it's important. The implied con- author concept helps us to kind of hold to that letter longer. And then, of course, we bring in what's going to help us interpret always including Acts. How do we bring in Acts? But I do think starting and staying there for a while has helped me, or at least it's influenced my interpretation, (laughs) whether that helps or not. Yeah, no, that's really good. You mentioned this camaraderie that seems to be throughout Philippians, and I don't disagree at all with you. Sometimes people have read this letter then through the lens of ancient friendship Mm -hmm. protocols, what, what do you think? You touch on that a little bit in the essay. Can you fill that out a little with us? Yeah. I mean, the, so the genre, clearly in ancient letters, subgenre, kind of what kind of letter has been debated in Philippians, because there isn't sort of a clear cut example prototype of any of them. But a friendship letter has gotten the most, I think, play. Fee and others have argued it's a letter of friendship because it it has this warmth and affection language and longing language, which is common to friendship, letters of friendship. He talks about absence and what the absence does to the relationship. We know that that comes up in chapters one and two of Philippians. Um, themes of unity and reciprocation, reciprocity, the end of the letter where Paul's thanking, but not really thanking explicitly for the gift so that they're not kind of feeling bound to return the favor. And also the way he talks about various enemies, or, you know, what we hear is kind of the opponents of Philippians. We're not sure if they're one group, two groups, three groups. It's hard. They're, they're, they're rather vague, but that's kind of a letter of friendship because the, the key is this friendship against the backdrop of sort of more of the, the enmity. But there is no language of philos or philia, friendship in the letter itself. So some people have said, well, you know, are these really kind of clear cut signs of a letter of friendship? I do think it's I think there's a theme of friendship in the letter, even if you don't have a genre identification kind of nailed down. I mean, they are friends. I mean, they're more than that. They're siblings in the Messiah. They're brothers and sisters. But there is this warmth that friendship, I think today that language helps us. This is a letter that, these are people that like each other. (laughs) 
Paul likes them. They like Paul. They actually feel deeply, it seems, for him and for his woes and cares in prison. Yes, yes. And he appreciates them. Yeah, I'm moved by the details about Epaphroditus and, you know, that Paul shares, even though the previous chapter, you know, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. And he seems so, you know, bold and staunch in his emotional or almost lack of emotion, you know, and whatever happens, I'm okay. And in the next chapter, he's like, wow, I was almost undone mm -hmm. by the possibility that Epaphroditus would go home to the Lord. I mean, it's not like he wasn't part of the Christian group. And yet Paul recognized just how painful personally it would be. And you share those kinds of things with your friends. Yeah, yeah, that's really helpful um, to hear. And, and even in chapter one, where he's assuring them that he's all right, part of it is he's just, he knows they're so concerned about him. He wants them to know he's okay and the gospel's all okay. You know, so the sort of the strong language, I think, shows again the relationship. He doesn't want them to worry. The first thing he does in the letter, right? After the, the greeting, it's all the stuff you expect. It's like, don't be alarmed. I'm okay. You know, I mean, what a lovely way. That's what that's what a mom would do. I'm just saying. That's what a dad would do. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes. Well, and then there's the deep, rich theology, too, especially in chapter two with what some people identify as the Christ hymn or the Christ poem. How does that fit in? Tell us some of the sort of the highlights, what you talk about in the essay about how we might want to read the or the options for reading that that section of Philippians. Yeah, I was just really grabbed by that when I was working through Philippians. I got it. It's my first thing I've written in Paul, our dictionary, Paul and his letters, articles, and the Philippians commentary. I've taught in Paul a lot, but I hadn't written in Paul. So I was invited to do some lectures a few years ago, and I ended up doing, that on, doing them on the scintillating topic of the embedded genres in the New Testament. Okay, good. Yep. So, But I did, one of the reasons was because I was very interested in this poem, I do call it the Christ poem, in, in the middle of Philippians. And that's one of my chapters. It's coming, the book's coming out this summer, and, and one whole chapter is devoted to the poem in the letter. Poem in a letter. And what does it mean to pay attention to the shift in genre? So that we're not reading prose anymore, and we're interpreting in a way that's giving due to the poetic. So that became a really interesting piece. So I've, I've kind of expanded on what I talked about in the entry and in my commentary in this chapter. And the setup, you know, of course, is a prose setup in your relationships with one another. Have the mindset, have the mindset as Christ Jesus. That setup is either have the mindset which was in Christ Jesus, the one he had, or the one which you have in Christ Jesus, because you are in the Messiah. So there's either charismatic reading, which is the one that, you know, self, self, if it kind of, we have this already. This is the mindset, live into it. But first, it's this thing we participate in. And the other is more of the example, follow the example. It's kind of the ethical reading, have this mindset, which was also in Christ Jesus's. I think that's the way I tend to read it, because he's just given them a number of commands exhortations about not being selfish, but in humility, valuing others after yourselves. And then he gives them Jesus as example, exemplar. But then he gives it to them in a poem. So is this a pre-existing hymn? Is it a poem that Paul writes? I do think it's highly poetic. And that's my argument, both in the commentary and in this other new work I'm do I've done. And it just it's just a beautiful, cadenced, parallel lines, kind of thing. And we hear about one who has his at the height of status, who goes to the lowest point of status, that downward mobility kind of. Hellerman has emphasized that this, these are status, the very form of God, the very form of a slave. You couldn't get farther apart. And here's what Christ does on our behalf and becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so sort of the, the Roman execution of Jesus, his identity as both God and now human you know, the slave, I think, is a metaphor for kind of that long or a big divide that he crosses. And then the exaltation that God brings to him using Isaiah, uh, draws on Isaiah, and shows this glorification kind of that happens. And he's our example for being humble. And in the midst of Roman Philippi, you know, Roman colony, wow, to hear the command really to, to humility, to humble service, that's powerful because that's not the Roman world, right? You don't move from the status you're at. That's, you don't degrade yourself, you don't humiliate yourself. And here he says, Paul says, no, this Jesus we follow is utterly different than the lords and gods and leaders of, of Rome. 
So I think the poem just functions to both kind of bring praise into this moment, uh, a pause and a praise, but also an example and a, a powerful example of Christ as the one we are to follow. Yes. I know one of the things that you also try to tease out in this essay is that we might have had misconceptions either about the letter itself or about Philippi. You just mentioned uh, it's a Roman colony. Are there any? Is there anything we should know further about Philippi that helps us understand this letter? I was so helped by Peter Oak's work, uh, Philippi, what letter to people? Philippians, letter to people, I guess what it is, where he does some uh, sociological modeling, both historical work and then thinking about cities and how this all would have worked out. And he suggests, so traditionally, and I remember learning this, that this was a colony, so therefore they were all veterans who came. They're all Roman veterans who show up, right? That that's who the church would be, all these Roman veterans. And so the war imagery is really powerful, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. It is the case that, uh, I mean, if, if Oaks is correct, only about 40% of the city is Roman. And that doesn't mean all of them were veterans or families of veterans. There certainly were some, but more of the city were Greek. And so more of the church likely also Greek folks, because that's who was there originally, right? Thracians, Greece, Greeks, etc. So kind of getting that feel for context that really prioritizes Roman values, but isn't necessarily all, all Romans, but has the status as a city of sort of Rome on another soil, on Greek soil. So kind of how that functioned to really press Philippians toward Roman ideals. And Paul presses them toward Christological ideas. And sometimes those are not too far apart, and sometimes they are very far apart, like in with humility. Humility is decidedly not a Greco-Roman virtue. But other virtues, there might be some shared space there. So I think one thing Paul does in the letters to really press them to think about their own context and to evaluate. So he uses language of phroneo, which is about being like-minded. I mean, considering, that's other language you use, considering where they fit and what Christ has done and how that works. And then legitsomai, also to consider, to evaluate whatever is pure and lovely and good and all that, evaluate it. Legitsomai. I don't think it's just think about it, like think nice thoughts. It's about evaluating the virtues that have been put out before you and say, now, what does it mean that we've learned from Christ and we've learned Christ and Christ informs the way we think about the ideals and we've inherited some of the categories from Gre the Greco-Mormon world, but we don't fill them with the same things necessarily. That's chapter four, verse eight, nine. That's right. Yes. No, that's so true. And just before you were referring there in the virtues in chapter four, and just before that, at the end of chapter three, he talks about Jesus as the Savior. Mm who is coming, and that we're citizens of heaven. So, right, how does a citizen of heaven think about goodness and yes. all of that? Yeah, filling. And how do they think about Roman citizenship, which they may or may not have? They certainly would have seen preferred in this context, but we are citizens of the gospel, of the kingdom, of you know, so he uses the language of citizenship in 320, but also in 127, he uses a verb form of that. Only time Paul uses it, Paul goes, oh my, make sure you're citizen of the right place. Now, you know, this is, be a worthy citizen of gospel land. He doesn't really name it as a land, right? But it's it's of the gospel, you know, so the kingdom, I think, is in view there. So we have interesting choices of language in this Roman letter to a Roman colony. Which can certainly help us today as we think about, you know, there were not nation states in the ancient world the way we have today, but there were people attached to the space that they lived in and their people group. And um, Jesus is savior of the world. Yes. So much bigger. Mm hmm. Yep. So our, our vista should be bigger. Exactly. Yes. Yes. You mentioned as we finish up our conversation, you mentioned that you've got a book coming out again. You have followed Dr. Stein in being a publishing machine here, so. Thank you. I don't know. It's quite that regular, but yes, every few years something comes out right. That's so great. Remind us again of what the title is that's coming out. It's a Baker academic book called Embedded Genres in the New Testament and talks about their interpretive difference it makes to kind of pay attention to embedded genres for interpretation, interpretive significance or something like that. That's great. That's great. And what other, do you have something else that's just kind of starting out that you're working on? I wish I was further along. Yes. I'm in First Peter right now because I've spent a lot of time in my career 
teaching in First Peter and written a couple journal articles. It's always been an interest area. And I have the NICNT, New International Commentary of the New Testament in First Peter. So to, ma- to join your volume from Ephesians. Wonderful. And be talking about household codes, clearly. Uh, First Peter. So I'm working on that. And then I do have a, in the New Word Biblical Themes series. So just get to talk about themes in a book. I have First Peter. So I intentionally aligned those so that I would be working on them at the same time. So now into the near future. You are ambidextrous, moving from the uh, general epistles and the Pauline epistles and the gospels. Uh, Thank you so much, Janine, for talking with us about the Dictionary of Paulinist Letters and your two superb essays in the volume. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be a part of that. And I love to now encourage students to use it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Behind the Books from IVP Academic. Join us next week when Lynn Kohick chats with contributor Helen Ree. Behind the Books is a production of IVP Academic. For more information on any IVP titles mentioned in this episode, visit ivpress.com and use code IVPOD25. That's IVPOD25 for 25% off. Sound Engineering by Honest Podcasts. Our producers are Alexandra Horn and Travis Albertson. Our production assistants are Christine Felicio Mello and Jack Reese. Our hosts are Scott McKnight, Lynn Kohick, Nijay Gupta, John Boyd, and Alexandra Horn. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and leave a rating and review to support the show. 